EMD's E-Series of locomotives, a uniquely styled dual-engine beast of a locomotive designed for a time that unfortunately for U.S. railroads would never come. Thanks to massive technological advancements as well as a transportation revolution that would be brought upon by a world war that no one could have seen coming. Late 1920s to late 30s America proved to be a very challenging time to be a business of any kind, especially a transportation company. With consumers concerned about putting food on the table and keeping themselves alive, a thought of taking a trip for fun was essentially unthinkable. Even if one did have money at this point, one would be far less likely to spend that money on something they really didn't absolutely need. That is to say, buying a new car just because the current car they had was a few years old but was perfectly usable. Or even in not such good shape but repairable. As miserable and as terrible as a time as this was for the world, let alone America, with some former millionaires reduced to selling apples on the street, one could certainly say there was actually one very critical positive that came out of the Depression. Americans weren't just willing to hand over money for a service or a product anymore, especially if said service or product resembled what said American was utilizing and or had at that time. It had to have real quality behind it, and an enhanced quality beyond what was there before. Not to mention some sort of huge innovation that made it noticeably better than the previous product, be it something as mundane as, say, a household appliance like a vacuum cleaner. It was in this context that the streamlined passenger train was born. Railroads themselves had been hit hard by the Depression, with the ICC or Interstate Commerce Commission slowly but surely ramping up its regulations which would eventually nearly strangle the railroad industry to death, as well as high operating expenses from the likes of steam locomotives, which was, again, the only type locomotive, with the exception of some electric locomotives in some isolated parts of the United States, available for pulling trains at that time. There was, however, a new technology slowly but surely being pushed out by the likes of companies like Winton, which would eventually become part of General Motors, as well as other locomotive companies such as Alco, called the diesel engine. While this concept itself was unique, it wasn't entirely new. As early as the early 1900s, self-propelled rail cars were being introduced across the United States, but mainly on lower density rural lines, slash branch lines, which would not allow for practical service if they were propelled by full-on steam engines. These coaches, while noticeably underpowered compared to a full-on steam engine for the time, at least, could certainly do the job of hauling passengers and could even tow a trailing car if necessary. More importantly, this particular type of railroad vehicle could be utilized for less than the price than even a small steam locomotive. Much like the automobiles of the day, most of these models were gasoline propelled, but a few were diesel. And these two fuel choices would play a critical role in the upcoming development of the streamlined passenger train, although one would prove superior. Now, while there were other alternatives to this, including steam turbine locomotives and gasoline-propelled locomotives, a diesel-propelled rail car or locomotive would prove to be much more reliable than the alternatives, as well as more efficient. The first self-propelled diesel locomotive-type box cab, as they were called, was produced by Alco in 1924, in partnership with General Electric, called the 60-tonner. This engine was not a looker, to put it mildly. It was not meant to be attractive, it was meant to be utilitarian and practical, designed to get steam engines out of tight urban environments in which the bulges of steam and smoke were simply considered intolerable. These engines were never meant to do long-haul jaunts, just move cars around on tight sidings where a steam engine would take them to where they actually needed to go, whether this being to a neighboring town or cross-country. Railroads were very hesitant to embrace the new diesel technology as they simply couldn't see it as replacing steam engines. This is the old school way of thinking, and it would actually take some of the steam engine locomotive producers, specifically Baldwin and Lima, down in future years. The Depression, however, would change all of this, nudging companies in the direction of saving money in any way, shape, and form. The main issue with steam engines, as I have mentioned in several of my other videos, feel free to check them out, is that they tend to cost a lot in terms of maintenance, not just fuel consumption, requiring massive back shops and a lot of downtime. Essentially, due to their much lower maintenance, resulting in much lower downtime, especially when compared with steam engines, a railroad, for a rough example, could, say, employ two diesel engines to cover, say, a small branch line that would have normally have to have been covered by four steam engines 
with the maintenance of keeping said diesel locomotives in service much lower and the fuel these diesel locomotives ran on being much cheaper. In addition to the very beautiful but unfortunately highly inefficient and highly expensive to operate steam engines, there was also the extreme weight of the old school passenger cars, which in turn kept the expenses for hauling passengers high. This affected several railroad companies at the time in terms of being able to even break even with their expenses on operating passenger trains, let alone turn a profit. Specifically, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad, whose passenger service was beginning to tank the company by 1932, enter its new president, and very young at that, Ralph Budd, who made getting the Burlington's passenger service profitable a top priority. Now, while Bud was already 50 years old at this point, it was still considered young for a chairman of the time. Understandably, one might ask at this point as to why a long-established railroad like the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy take a chance on his relatively new upstart, as some might have called him. Well, the fact of the matter was, Bud had a very long and impressive resume. From the 1920s, he started working on the Rock Island, helping with construction issues as a surveyor. He worked his way up through that railroad and eventually found himself in charge, that is to say the president of the Great Northern Railroad, at the age of 40. He was, at that time, the youngest person to ever chair a railroad in the United States. During his time as president of the Great Northern Railroad, Bud would demonstrate his ability to innovate, utilizing his past experience, thus proving despite his age, he was more than up to the job. A good example was the construction of the Cascades Tunnel. Like most railroads that bridged the gap between east to west in the United States, the Great Northern needed to negotiate a group of mountain ranges that separated the east and west United States called the Continental Divide. The original tactic to ascending these mountain ranges was to utilize a series of switchbacks. This is to say where the train switches off one track and then reverses up another. The issue with this, of course, is that the trains would then be at the mercy of the terrible Rocky Mountain snow, a.k.a. Sierra Cement. The situation was so grim on the Great Northern that many trains would be derailed or destroyed by the snow, leading to many fatalities. But innovated and simple approach of simply tunneling through the divide meant that the trains could avoid the switchbacks and thus not be subject to the whims of the weather. This plus excellent leadership abilities caused him to fall to the radar of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, who were in desperate need of new management, as they had plenty of red ink and not much else to show for it. And one of the company's greatest money losers was its passenger service. Now one might ask, why didn't the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, otherwise known as the Burlington Route, just abandon their passenger service to save themselves the red ink? The answer is, this simply wasn't an option. The government had a requirement via the ICC that all railroads maintain a passenger service. And so this gave the railroads of the time who were desperate to try to avoid as much rent as possible impetus to try to make this particular service profitable. In addition to turning to internal combustion engines, in this case a diesel engine, to propel his new train, he would need to find a new type of coach that was lightweight, lighter than anything around. To this end, Ralph Budd would actually turn to who would turn out to be a distant relative, Ed Budd, who had founded a company simply known as the Budd Company, who specialized in producing lightweight diesel rail cars using stainless steel, which the company had developed a technique to weld together. The stainless steel was notably lighter than heavyweight coaches at the time, so light that an entire set of these coaches actually weighed less than what one single heavyweight coach would have weighed. This would in turn allow one of these modern trains to accelerate much more rapidly and also more efficiently, requiring less power to get to a higher speed. Surprisingly, all this was achieved without giving up structural rigidity. In fact, in many cases, these new stainless steel streamlined coaches were actually notably stronger than the heavyweight iron coaches they replaced. And thus, all these different pieces of the puzzle were gathered together to create the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy's first streamlined train, known as the Zephyr or specifically to give it its full name, the Pioneer Zephyr. But the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy wasn't the only railroad to have this idea. The Union Pacific was developing its M10,000 in parallel to this particular model. While many confuse this particular streamliner as essentially being a copy of the actual Pioneer Zephyr, it was in fact a completely different design altogether, with the exception of the fact that it was designed to go fast with less weight. 
For example, instead of being made of stainless steel, the M10,000 was made of reinforced aluminum, which would prove to be a problem in the long run due to its lack of strength compared to the stainless steel, as to further save weight, it was cut to an extremely thin width, and also the fact that aluminum, while corrosion resistant, is not as resistant as stainless steel is, hence the name stainless steel. As efficient and attractive looking as these new streamlined trains were, not to mention fast with the Burlington Zephyr achieving a top speed of around 150 miles per hour on its inaugural run, cutting the time travel between Chicago and Denver by several hours, they were not just pretty faces. For example, their passenger accommodations were notably more comfortable than the previous models, not to mention done in an art deco slash streamlined style, something that was all the rage again in the 1930s when these trains debuted. While these streamlined sets were certainly beautiful and definitely had their advantages, they had major disadvantages, including making it almost impossible to add cars to these particular sets, as they were semi-permanently coupled together, and also utilized shared trucks or bogies to save weight, not to mention friction. Also, if the train's power car, which functioned as its locomotive, were to fail, the whole set would largely be put out of service. The end result, only one of the M10,000s would actually be constructed, and while there would be a few of the Burlington Zephyrs built, the Burlington, Union Pacific, and other such companies that operated these streamlined car sets would quickly begin to realize that it would be much more effective and practical to design future streamlined trains as conventional train sets. This would, of course, alleviate the issues in terms of lengthening a train, as well as substituting a locomotive should it fail. This would also enable new luxuries unheard of added to these particular train sets. In addition to Vista and full dome cars, many new features were added to these trains, such as rolling barber shops, dining cars featuring very intimate private booths, a tail end streamlined observation car with massive windows for excellent views outside the rear of the train, and extremely spacious sleeping accommodations. Needless to say, these new and highly innovative trains were major hits with the public, and soon there was a huge demand for them, not to mention a demand for locomotives to propel these new streamlined trains along on the tracks. Companies such as Alco and, of course, EMD, GM's locomotive division, would begin to fill this demand, which segues us neatly to the topic of this particular documentary, the EMDE units. General Motors EMD, or Electromotive Division, was formed in the early 1930s with the acquisition of a diesel engine producer called the Winton Company, who had a wide product category ranging from everything from stationary applications to marine applications, and of course diesel engines for locomotives, better known as prime movers. This company would eventually be renamed by EMD to its Cleveland Diesel Engine Division, followed shortly thereafter by the acquisition of what was then known as the EMC, or Electromotive Company. Company, after which GM would then rename this division EMD, short for Electromotive Division. The company would actually be set up initially to look for mobile applications for diesel engines, to which GM could dominate his new markets. In 1933, after seeing EMC's, now EMD Division's, success with providing propulsion units for the original Burlington Northern Zephyr, as well as the M10,000, the company would essentially dive headfirst into the production of diesel locomotives for the domestic U.S. market. Most notably, the more successful 600-horsepower engine that propelled the Zephyr, specifically a Winton 201A two-stroke, eight-cylinder prime mover equipped with a roots blower as well as fuel injection, which allowed the Zephyr to reach speeds of an excess of 100 miles per hour along its route, plus the uniquely comfortable accommodations these trains offered compared to the old-style heavyweight coaches and steam-propelled trains of the time, caused a sudden and massive demand man to develop for these new ways of traveling by rail, causing the Pullman Standard Company who had been involved with the M10,000 and the Bud Company who had been involved with the original Zephyr to enter into major contracts with EMD for the production of more of these streamliners. The end result of this was the construction of a new locomotive plant in McCook, Illinois, and the company's first type standalone locomotive in 1935, referred to as the BB. Essentially, this was a prototype range of models which only 
encompass five locomotives being produced, with the bodies for the earliest examples being subcontracted out to the St. Louis Car Company. Like many early production diesel locomotives, these were not streamlined units, but rather box cab type locomotives. Essentially, they were little more than oversized box cars that were self-propelled. These units would utilize two 12-cylinder 201A Winton power plants, making 900 horsepower apiece for a total of 1,800 horsepower. This model would be followed up upon by EMC, as it was still known at this time, by a model called the TA. Only six of these, again, prototype locomotives were built by EMC, again powered by a 12-cylinder Winton 201 prime mover. The TA would essentially put in place the basic design for the E-Series going forward with six axle trucks and a very unique streamlined nose that had the headlight neatly trimmed and tucked within the nose itself. The elongated rake of the nose also nicely blended into the body of this particular unit, something that would again be carried forward on many of the future E-unit models. With the success of these prototype slash demonstrator units, this in turn would lead GM to develop its first streamlined standalone road locomotive produced in-house at its new plant called the EA slash B model as it produced both a cab unit as well as a cabless booster unit. These massive six axle behemoths produced 1,800 horsepower, once again utilizing two 201A Winton Prime movers to make this horsepower, but were developed largely as a passenger hauling locomotive designed specifically to haul the new standalone streamlined coaches being built by the Bud as well as Pullman Standard companies. Another note on the E, A, and B models, these were largely built for the Baltimore and Ohio as an almost a one-off creation. This is something its successor, the E1, would share. Like every E unit that EMD would ever build or EMC Corporation at this point, these units had an A1A wheel arrangement. This is to say one powered axle followed by an unpowered axle or idler powered by another powered axle. In short, only four axles are powered, the first and last axle of each truck, with the other two being the center axles on these trucks being the idlers. Note another consistent and strange quirk of the early units is their extremely low production numbers. As with several of the later models in this lineage, as it would take EMC Corporation, soon to be renamed EMD, a while to get its mass production up and running. It was also the issue with the economy still not fully recovered from the depression, as well as the fact that many railroads still questioned the viability of diesel locomotives, although this would quickly change. Larger, the E1 was essentially built for the Baltimore and Ohio, with the same mechanical underpinnings, retaining its two Winton 201A 12-cylinder prime movers for a total output of 1,800 horsepower. The main difference here was the styling, with some minor tweaks done to the nose to make it stick out from its predecessor, although not drastically so. In terms of the rest of its looks, including the vents as well as the squared windows, it was essentially the same locomotive. But again, please note that some of these engines would be later modified to look like later models because parts from those later models were easier to obtain. Only six E1As and six E1Bs were built. Again, these were more or less test units. With just eight of them built between 1937 and 38, built bespoke for a specific company. EMD had not yet introduced mass production of its locomotives. The E2 was yet another similar case. Only two AB sets, four units total, two Bs and two As, were produced for the Union Pacific Railroad in 1937. They again featured two Winton 201A prime movers, making a total of 1,800 horsepower each. Again, this is to say the A units and the B units. The nose was once again modified, this time with a much more prominent headlight. Other than this minor distinction, this locomotive is largely the same locomotive as the EA and E1. Another possible explanation why these early E units were built in such minimal numbers was the fact that the 201A Winton power plant was not known for reliability, to put it mildly. Union Pacific would later repower these E2s with the more reliable 567 prime mover, increasing their horsepower and also making them notably more reliable. The next unit in EMD's E lineage is the E3. 17 of these massive units were produced between September of 1937 and June of 1940. 
These locomotives were some of the first from EMD to feature the company's new 12-cylinder 567 prime mover, cranking out 1,000 horsepower, in this case two of them for a total of 2,000. The most noticeable spotting feature of this locomotive is the rake of its nose and its prominent headlight bucket. Only one E3 survives, specifically number 501, originally built for the Atlantic coastline. A successor to the E3 was the E4, which, interestingly enough, started production before the E3. Only 14A units and 5B units of this particular model were produced. 13 of the A and 4 of the B units were built for the seaboard coastline, with one remaining A and one remaining B units being demonstrators between 1938 and 1940. There isn't much to be said about this locomotive, essentially it was simply a reproduction of the E3 with the same specifications, two 567 prime movers making a thousand horsepower each for a total of 2000 and the same design cues as the previous E3. No E4s exist, all of them were scrapped. The successor for the E4 was the E5. 11A units and 5B units were built exclusively for the Burlington route aka the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. Again, with the exception of some very minor upgrades, this essentially was the same as its predecessor locomotives, utilizing two 567s, creating a 1,000 horsepower apiece for a total output of 2,000 horsepower. By this point in time, we've reached 1941, and another issue would begin to slow production of these particular units, World War II. The E units, again, were designed specifically as a passenger unit and were not practical as freight locomotives, mainly due to their gearing and their extreme length, which would make it harder to utilize them in tight clearance areas. And most freight during World War II, on top of everything else, would be hauled by steam engines, as again, coal was not rationed, but diesel fuel was. Not to mention a general shortage of parts for these particular locomotives, not to mention mechanics to keep them running, as many of these mechanics were drafted into the war effort, and the electronics for these locomotives required to keep them running were highly sophisticated for the time, which were again also prioritized for the war effort. And what few parts would be available to repair these diesel locomotives would be kept and or prioritized for the freight diesel locomotives produced by EMD. And even these parts that would be kept available for these engines would be limited, as again, most tonnage would move by steam. The final E unit to be released before World War II would be the E6. It would also be the last unit to have the specific slat nose, as it was called, that all of the previous E units have had. With 92 A units and 26 B units built, it was also the first E unit to go into mass production, with 17 different railroads ordering these particular models. Mechanical specifications were again unchanged with two 567s, each with 12 cylinders, making a thousand horsepower apiece. The next locomotive in the E unit lineage is the E7. Introduced in 1945, just after the end of the war, 428 A units and 82 B units were built. Much like most post war automobile production in the United States, this locomotive was not much more than a reissue of the previous E-unit models introduced before the war. Again, containing the same 567As, again, each rated at 1,000 horsepower, for a total of 2,000 horsepower, again, two apiece per locomotive, and featuring the same traction motors, wheel arrangements, etc. The main defining feature of this locomotive was its nose. It was noticeably less slanted and noticeably more blunt looking much more like the EMD FT units which were in service throughout the war. This is apparently done as a cost-cutting measure to make it cheaper to produce this locomotive. There were several reasons why this locomotive sold noticeably better than its predecessors. One of the most notable reasons was the fact that the equipment being utilized for World War II had been completely worn out. Calling the steam locomotives that had somehow managed to survive the massive strain of transporting all of that cargo from one coast to the other for World War II and vice versa, threadbare was a dramatic understatement. The other reason being is that the diesel locomotives, what few were in service at this time, had proven to be much lower on maintenance, meaning that more of these engines could stay in service for longer, reducing operating expenses drastically, and not requiring numerous backup locomotives to be on hand to cover one particular run due to all the maintenance required. And also, the fuel they ran on, being the diesel fuel, proved far less expensive to acquire and far cheaper to handle, especially due to the fact that these locomotives were notably more efficient than steam engines. 
not requiring the constant stoppage for fuel, not to mention several water and cooling towers maintained for this purpose, or worse still, being stopped to be swapped out in order to have maintenance performed on them. With all this in mind, EMD's competitor, Alco, wasn't going to sit on the sidelines any longer. Having been forced out of diesel locomotive production during World War II due to the fact that the company was largely a steam locomotive manufacturer and didn't build much in the way of diesel engines, and therefore would not receive government contracts for diesel locomotive production with the exception of a few switchers. Lack of government contracts for the utilization of a diesel locomotive in World War II meant that the company did not have the ability to develop a new prime mover or new locomotive model, putting Alco at a distinct disadvantage once the war finally came to a close. With its most modern power plant being that of the aging 539 prime mover, which was introduced before the war and only created 1,000 horsepower with six cylinders and turbocharging. And while this prime mover did at least tie the current production 567 that EMD was producing at the time, EMD had already started development of a new version of its 567, known as the 567B, which would make 1200 horsepower at first in its 12-cylinder form, but would quickly be upgraded to 16 cylinders and to 1500 horsepower and eventually 1750 horsepower. To try and mitigate this, the company had rushed together a new prime mover called the 244, which unlike the 539 could accept 16 cylinders and was also notably more sophisticated and modern compared to the 539. Then thanks to its locomotive building partner GE who handled all of its electronics, somehow managed to borrow a locomotive design, specifically that of the Fairbanks Morris Erie built locomotive, of which GE was contracted to build for Fairbanks Morris due to Fairbanks Morris' lack of capacity to produce this particular locomotive, and thanks to a clever appliance designer by the name of Ray Patton, managed to make modifications to to turn into what would be one of the most glamorous, if not the most glamorous, diesel locomotives ever built. That's right, I'm talking about the Alco PA. While these beautiful locomotives would win accolades for their looks, as well as the smooth ride they gave the crew, not to mention the fact that they belch smoke much like steam engines, and their excellent performance at high altitudes, as well as their extremely sophisticated turbocharged 244 power plants, producing the same total horsepower of 2,000 that the current production E-units could, but with just one prime mover, and in the later PB-2 variant even more, at 2,250, thus noticeably reducing fuel consumption and maintenance, the rushed into production 244 plus shoddy electronics by GE with the exception of the traction motors doomed this locomotive. With chronic breakdowns, many of these engines were scrapped not long into their careers, few actually made it to the 50s, with the exception of a few engines that managed to make it into the Santa Fe days with most of these units being scrapped. And while they certainly would outsell the Alco PAs by themselves, the E7s didn't fare much better here, with all but one of them being scrapped, the remaining unit being on static display. The next locomotive in the EMD E unit lineage is the E8. 450A units and 46B units of this particular model were produced between August of 1949 and January of 1954. This E-unit model featured the new updated variant of the 567 known as the B, again with 12 cylinders, but this time making 1200 horsepower. The extra horsepower being a byproduct of a new type roots blower being utilized on this particular version of the 567. In addition to the more F-unit style nose which this locomotive shared with its predecessor, the E7, Notable changes were done to this locomotive on the outside to provide for very notable spotting features, such as portholes now being used on the sides of the locomotive instead of the square windows used before. Very similar to EMD's own F units. Another notation is the chicken wire vents. Originally these were small sections at various different points at the top of the locomotive. In this case, a singular chicken wire vent goes across the entire length of the engine on both sides. 58 of these units have been preserved in various different states. The rest were all scrapped. The final unit in EMD's E lineage is the E9. 100A units and 54B units were produced between April of 1954 and January of 1964. This new last variation of the E units featured the 567C variant of the prime mover with 12 cylinders, specifically two of which cranking out 1,350 horsepower apiece for a total of 2,400 horsepower. The E9s are exactly the same on the outside as their predecessors, the E8s, with no change in dimensions. And yes, in case you're wondering, 
This is essentially why GM did not put the 16-cylinder variant of the 567C inside this locomotive, as there simply wasn't enough space to accommodate two of these prime movers. All of this said, however, even in its 12-cylinder form, the 567C was able to crank out 1,500 horsepower more than its predecessor. This is achieved by a redesigned crankcase, which drastically reduced friction on the crankshaft, plus a completely overhauled cooling system to further improve efficiency. Not to mention reliability. Thanks to its updated electrical system, the E9 was actually much more reliable than its predecessor locomotives. Some considering this the finest passenger locomotive ever built for American railroads. One might then, and very understandably so, ask why this locomotive didn't sell better, having been outsold easily by the EMD F unit brand as well as the GP series, with the same being true for its less reliable predecessors in the E series. The fact was, America was entering a new time frame in terms of passenger transportation, not the specific time frame or era these particular behemoths were built for, where companies like Alco, GM, Bud and Pullman Standard had envisioned a world in which massive trains, as long as a hundred cars in length, would be pulled by several of these E-units. With insane concepts such as swimming pools and other such wellness facilities built aboard them, essentially turning them into mini cruise ships. Unfortunately, what all of these companies alike could not foresee was the dramatic effect World War II would have on passenger transportation. To start with, with the end of World War II, many airplanes that had been used for the war effort were now surplus. And the government, not wanting to hang on to these extra aircraft as well as store them, were letting them go for prices that were unheard of. This coupled with grants and loans available to returning GIs and other such Americans trying to start businesses after the war to get the economy going again, made it very easy to launch companies like airlines. Whether these companies hold freight or passengers, and unlike the railroads, they didn't have to build a line connecting the two places, or maintain said line since, of course, airplanes flew in the air. And while they would have to pay taxes like most companies do in the United States, depending upon whether they are a charity or not, they would obviously not be taxed on the ownership of said air since they flew in it and didn't own anything. All they had to do was set up shop at an airport, which would normally be built for them by the government and maintained for them by the government, by renting or buying a hangar to store their aircraft, convert said aircraft to passenger, freight, or both, get FAA certification for their company as well as file the necessary business documents, acquire said grant or low interest loan or both, and bingo, their airline was off the ground. <laughs> See what I did there? Okay, sorry, bad dad joke. Then, in 1956, the Eisenhower administration passed what was called the Federal Aid Highway Act. This essentially cleared the way and provided the financing for the interstate highway system to be built. This particular act couldn't have been better timed, as there was now an explosion in car ownership in the United States. This is mainly driven by the post-World War II boom, driven again by the fact that many families who usually and traditionally had one breadwinner now essentially had two, as one was off serving on the front lines and the other stayed back to work in the factory, or in some cases both were working in factories. This extra income could also not be spent during this period in time because many goods such as cars were simply not available due to the fact that their components were being rationed for the war effort or just not being produced at all. Now suddenly the consumer didn't need to buy a train ticket to go anywhere. They could literally jump in their car and pretty much drive anywhere in the United States. Of course, they'd then be responsible for the gas or any accidents that might occur along the way. Still, the freedom of being able to travel when you wanted and how you wanted and where you wanted and not being subject to a bus, railroad, or even an airline timetable or schedule was a new and intoxicating feeling that hit America like a thunderbolt. Speaking of the interstate highway system, trucking companies were able to spring up very quickly and easily because of this creation. Trucking companies, unlike railroads, didn't have to build or maintain their own roads. These were again provided by the government. And while they did have to pay taxes in general as well as to utilize these roads, it was nothing compared to the burden put on the railroads at this time. As in addition to the tracks, the railroad companies had to maintain their roundhouses, engine service facilities, etc., as well as anything else that had to do with line-side maintenance, such as sheds and signal towers. And as if this wasn't enough, and it certainly was, pay taxes on all of these items. The same could be said for bus companies, again not needing to own the roads they actually traveled on or maintain them. They just needed to buy a few buses, in some cases surplus again from the army. 
make arrangements to utilize usually one of the already completed bus stations built around the country, which were again provided for the bus companies, and whammo, they had a business that was quite literally on the road. Okay, I'll stop with the dad jokes. This and an ever-out-of-touch ICC, which seemed to be caught in a bygone era, where the railroads were monopolies and needed to be kept in their places, whose members may have had <clears throat> undue influence from outside sources to make their decisions, be them political or financial, plus increases in labor rates in general, turn the passenger railroad business into a money-losing operation. As early as the mid-60s, many railroads did whatever they could to try to cut back on passenger service to avoid the red ink coming with it. They couldn't completely cut the service out usually, as the ICC again mandated this be maintained. A more extreme example came on the Southern Pacific, who essentially abolished all of its dining car service for all of its trains, and completely eliminated sleeping car service for its long-distance overnight trains and multiple day trains. Replaced with just coach seating with coaches that were definitely worse for wear, and automat cars which usually didn't work correctly. And what I can only describe as extreme money grubbing, such as demanding rental fees for pillows and blankets to make oneself comfortable on the overnight trip. Finally, in 1971, Amtrak was formed and took over the railroad passenger service for the United States, with a few exceptions. In short, the E-series of locomotives was built for an era that never actually really arrived. With America's fascination turning skyward with the utilization of planes in World War II and new advances in aircraft technology in general, plus the establishment of the interstate highway system and the boom in private car ownership by consumers, combined together to essentially erase this era from ever coming into existence. And then, of course, there was the simple and unfortunate fact that by the time World War II had ended, prime mover technology and locomotive technology in general had far left these engines in the dust. Essentially, one railroad could get much more horsepower from a single prime mover equipped locomotive with four axles than they could from this massive six-axle behemoth. That would also, as an added bonus, weigh noticeably less. This would actually become yet another issue for the E-units, as some of them weighed simply too much to work on lighter rail. The end result of this had many railroads turn to EMD's own F-unit as an alternative, as it weighed notably less, was much smaller and easier to store and deal with, and as an added bonus, in addition to producing more horsepower, was also notably more fuel efficient. As again, more modern designs like the EMD-F units could produce as much or even more horsepower utilizing only a single prime mover, as in sharp contrast to the dual prime mover equipped EMD-E units. Few of these E units survived compared to the F units due to their lack of flexibility. The fact of the matter was these massive dual engine behemoths were gas guzzlers with their two-stroke prime movers not being considered efficient by themselves, let alone in an application where they were utilized in dual configurations. As for where they are now, well, that's a tricky question. The Penn Central, for example, found itself in big trouble by the early 1970s. Andrek had by this point assumed passenger service, but the company was short of small road switcher type locomotives to handle many of its small jobs. The main culprit was its already unreliable and as well as under-maintained RS3 fleet. Unable to even buy used locomotives to replace these engines, the Penn Central essentially made lemonade out of two lemons, pulling the 567s out of these massive E-units, rebuilding them, and placing one apiece in these old RS3s after they received minor upgrades to accommodate them. This program was very successful, and many of these engines continue in service to this day. Then there's the story of a very prominent group of E-units that were formerly owned by the Burlington Northern's predecessors that would be rebuilt and equipped with hep power generators for use on Metra's Burlington Northern racetrack commuter line. This might seem odd, but it actually makes perfect sense. By supplying the locomotives for this particular service, Burlington Northern received a tax credit, and since it had a fleet of these engines from various different predecessor roads all set to go, they just required a rebuild, which again, much like the F units, was cheap to do, as many of these parts were still easy to come by. It made sense for Burlington Northern to go ahead with this deal, despite these engines' lack of fuel efficiency. Unfortunately, these units' lives on the racetrack would eventually come to an end, with pollution standards and the general wear and tear on these aging models catching up with them, not to mention their lack of fuel efficiency, with F-40s taking over their positions. 
A few of these locomotives were sold to Mark to help out with its fledgling commuter system, which was desperately looking for more power, but these engines didn't last long in this service, as the company decided instead to purchase an all-new rebuilt locomotive from Morrison Kuritsen called the GP40 WH-2. As mentioned before, as I went through each model, there are a lot of these engines scattered around the United States to this day, not all of them in operating condition, mainly on static display. As their massive sizes, not to mention lack of fuel efficiency, simply makes them impractical to be used per se a tourist line or even a commuter railroad. As again, there are several other alternatives to these engines on the used market, which produce more horsepower with a single engine, thus consuming less fuel than these behemoths would. While this story certainly doesn't come to the happiest of endings, it certainly is good to know that at least a few of these engines remain around to this day. In operation, delighting rail fans. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Please like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, keep the metal side down.